to introduce Adam Wiseman. He's an organizer with the Global Justice for Animals and the Environment, an organization uh, addressing the threat posed by free trade agreements to animals and the environment and safe, ethical, and sustainable food, and the human rights of environmental defenders. Adam also represents global justice for animals and the environment in Trade Justice New York Metro, a coalition of organizations from diverse social justice and environmental movements who are working together to resist the um, NAFTA free trade model and um, um, TPP, I'm sure, that you can visit Global Justice uh, for Animals and the Environment's website um, at gjae.org and also tradejustice.net. Welcome, Adam. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you so much for taking up this important issue and recognizing how TPP threatens to make it that much worse. So I wanted to talk a bit about uh, some of the threats that TPP poses regarding food safety and particularly in relation to this issue, some of which have already been addressed, but just to go into a little more detail on that. And then also to talk about what the state of play is in fighting TPP. TPP is an agreement that is still being negotiated. We still have a very real chance to stop it. Um, if we take action right now, as many of you have already been doing by your tremendously valuable uh, efforts to put pressure on Senator Wyden. So thank you all for your work in that area. It is crucially important. So there are a few areas that we need to be concerned about uh, regarding TPP and food safety, and particularly uh, imported unsafe foods. One of them is how TPP will deal with food imports. Now, just something that I want to say, prefacing this, something that we need to understand about the TPP process and how this, is, this agreement is being negotiated. Um, we need to, first of all, understand that much of what we know about TPP, um, we don't know. And what I mean by that is that TPP is being negotiated in secret. TPP in an unprecedented fashion and other uh, trade agreements being negotiated by the Obama administration are being negotiated under a complete veil of secrecy where the public is fully denied access to the negotiating text of these agreements in a way that has never been done in past trade negotiations. The Bush administration, as bad as its trade agreements were, were was vastly more transparent in terms of letting the public know what was happening in trade negotiations. Well, the Obama administration learned from the dismal failure to pass a free trade area of the Americas, which, which generated hemisphere-wide resistance. So their strategy is to keep that information from the public in order to shut people out and not make people realize what a real threat this agreement uh, can potentially pose. And that is also true of the other agreements the Obama administration has uh, been attempting to negotiate. They've also tried to maintain the secrecy, and that has generated strong resistance um, in, the in the negotiating countries. So, for example, with the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, there's now been, uh, there's now being for, uh, more openness is being pushed, whereas with TPP, we still have this, uh, this intense veil of secrecy. The, just recently, members of Congress were granted access to the TPP negotiating text. Until recently, even they had very strict and severe restrictions on their access. Congressman Alan Grayson, who was the first one to see any of these texts were reported that before this uh, most recent loosening, when he wanted to see the text of these agreements, he was required to go into a room, uh, closed door, couldn't make copies, couldn't take notes, couldn't bring staff, had someone from the office of the U.S. Trade Representative staring at him as he flipped through the pages of this document, trying to learn and remember what he could remember, and then was sworn to secrecy about everything he saw. So pretty much these negotiating texts are being tr tr classified as matters of national security, um, which is absurd because this is not a matter of national security. This is, uh, this is legislation and economic policy and trade policy. This is not uh, military secrets. There's no reason these documents should be classified except for one, which is that the Obama administration wants to keep the public from realizing how much the public interest is being compromised in favor of the corporate interests who have the inside track to this agreement. And what does that mean? Well, 600 corporate, uh, there are 600 advisors to the negotiating process who are called cleared advisors. They are part of industry trade advisory committees 
And these are committees that have special access to the TPP negotiating texts. They, uh, whereas our members of Congress have this highly restricted access that I've told you about and only now have slightly more access, and our, we, the public, have no access whatsoever, these members of negotiating committees can pull up the negotiating, te sorry, the, of advisory committees can pull up the negotiating text at the click of a button on their computers uh, and read the, read the documents and uh, give their advice to the negotiators as to what they would like to see in these agreements. So who are these negotiators? Well, uh, the vast majority of them, over 500 are advisors from corporations uh, and industry groups uh, representing some of the, the many, some of the corporations that many of us would be most concerned about in terms of issues around the environment, issues around uh, human rights, issues around labor rights, um, so these, are, th these corporations are the ones who have the inside track to this negotiation. The, uh, member, the public ha is locked out. Members of Congress have limited access. The media has no access. But the vast majority of the people who have this inside track access are the very corporate interests who we are fighting against in fighting this trade agreement. So, um, they, have, so they have that leg up on defining what's being negotiated and what we, and then once uh, the negotiation is complete, once the negotiation is complete, um, we then the trade agreement, if the Obama administration gets its way, will be railroaded directly to Congress with uh, no real opportunity in between for careful pub, for careful public review. And the way that they'll do that is through the process uh, known as fast track. And the way fast track works, fast track is Nixon era legislation that has been uh, repeatedly renewed. And uh, what it does is that Fast Track, uh, under the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution contains the Commerce Clause that really puts Congress in the driver's seat of international commercial negotiations, of really of uh, defining our international trade policy, our, commercial, our international commercial policy. Uh, Fast Track delegates that authority to the, to the administration, to the executive branch, so that the administration can negotiate trade agreements. Uh, with con Congress can put guidelines on those negotiations, but it has, or we can suggest guidelines, but they're completely non-binding. The administration then sends uh, the fully negotiated trade agreements uh, to Congress in the form of implementing legislation. So Congress, uh, in effect, puts them into law. And then Congress, in a way that is unique to any U.S. legislation, um, has a special expedited process for passing that legislation. So what does that mean? It means that Congress is required to vote on the legislation in 90 days, 60 in the House. And let's be clear, these are negotiating documents that are hundreds and hundreds of pages long, sometimes well over 1,000 pages long. And Congress, uh, with, their, with all the other bills they have to consider, has uh, two to two months in the House and three in the Senate to fully understand these impl the implications of these agreements that have been negotiated in secret. So civil society is locked out of actually being able to do analysis for the full length of the negotiation. Then everyone has to rush to study the documents and understand their implications, try to advise Congress, while Congress is, is while the corporate lobbyists go into overdrive, twisting arms, trying to push legislators to support these agreements. But the time limit is only one of the pieces that makes fast track so terrifying. Fast track also uh, prevents Congress from holding up bills in committee, and they can't, this is a key piece, they cannot amend any piece of this legislation. They, are, they can't change a period, they can't change a comma, they can't change a single word, because the negotiation is treated as a done deal. Any bill that goes to Congress, no matter what it is, Congress can amend that legislation. They can make changes if they, if they want to add riders, if they want to strike language, if something is badly written, they can make changes. Fast Track is designed to prevent that. And that's not all. Uh, Fast Track is also actually designed to prevent debate on the legislation. Now, we understand that the role of Congress is to deliberate on legislation, to have this body, this body that is supposed to carefully consider uh, our laws and have uh, vigorous debate, and then hopefully, not often the case, but hopefully come out with the best possible policy having heard all of the different arguments. Fast Track is designed to prevent that. Fast Track it requires each House to have only 20 hours of debate on the legislation. And what that means, you might think that means, well, okay, they can have two hours one day, six hours the next, three hours another day. No. It means that at tw the, once they start floor debate, the clock is ticking, and then at the end of 20 hours, debate is over. Uh, if they 
debate something else in the meantime, it doesn't matter. They have 20 hours from the start point. Congressman Alan Grayson has estimated that that means that in the House, each member, if every member of the House wanted to testify, they would have 88 seconds per member of Congress to testify. So really, you can see that Fast Track is designed to railroad trade agreements through Congress. It's been sold to Congress as a way to put Congress in charge. The way that President Obama is pushing this on Congress now is the idea that this is how Congress has its say on the negotiations. Because what the Obama administration did outrageously is it has negotiated three trade agreements as if it was already as if it already had Fast Track. The president is not just supposed to go and negotiate trade agreements. But President Obama has been negotiating TPP for over five years and is now also negotiating the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership and the Trade and Services Agreement. So the Obama administration is marketing TPP, uh, Fast Track, as if, well, this is how Congress has its say, when just the opposite is true. The key thing that can happen right now with Fast Track um, is that Fast Track not happen. If Congress refuses to pass Fast Track, then what happens is these agreements will have to go to Congress under the regular order, meaning the normal procedures by which Congress considers legislation. Congress will be able to carefully deliberate over the text of, these, of this legislation. They will be able to make amendments as needed. They will be able to have as much debate as they want, and they can vote on it on their own timeline. And so some of the issues that – I'm sorry, did someone – Okay. Some of the issues that uh, we need to make sure get addressed in order to prevent this trade agreement from being so disastrous in terms of food safety and particularly in terms of this issue, uh, a few key points. One is that trade agreements uh, like TPP um, actually affect our inspection process. We are in, it designed, it, uh, they're designed to allow it to encourage us to treat uh, the inspection processes of other countries in the agreement as equivalent to our own, even if their food inspection systems uh, violate key principles of our own food safety laws. So if we're already concerned that Japan is selectively testing and we're already concerned uh, that uh, then we can, then think about the implication of Japan's food inspection system being treated as equivalent to our own, particularly if we're trying to push for more stringent rules in the U.S. than we already have. Uh, we heard before about this possibility for lawsuits, and I want to talk a little bit of, more about how that process works because it really is worth understanding just how absurd this is. Uh, tra since NAFTA, trade agreements have been uh, have included language, many trade agreements have included um, an investor state uh, dispute settlement process, and what that means is that corporate investors are able to bring countries. Uh, to international tribunals outside the jurisdiction of their own national court system, uh, where those corporations can sue for unlimited sums in lost expected future profits, meaning that a corporation can claim that if an environmental, food safety, or other public interest law interferes with their expectation of future profits, uh, they, can, uh, they can name the theoretical sum of how much money they think they would have made into the infinite future and demand compensation for that amount. Uh, some of the cases where that's happening right now under current trade agreements, there's a case where Peru is being sued for over $800 million because they've required a smelting site that's classified as one of the 10 most toxic sites in the world to remediate, uh, to do uh, toxic remediation. The uh, U.S. investor has brought a suit for $800 million, not wanting to have to remediate the site. There's a case in El Salvador where El Salvador is being sued for over $300 million because El Salvador prevented a mining company from mining using uh, toxic chemicals near the largest, the river, the Rio Lempa, that provides 60% of the drinking water in the country. There, and that's the case under the Central America, U.S. Central America Free Trade Agreement. And something that's important to understand about that case and why these rules are so dangerous, the company involved in that case is a company called Pacific Rim. Pacific Rim is primarily a Canadian company. Canada is not part of the U.S. Central America Free Trade Agreement. So what did they do? They used a small subsidiary called Pacific Rim Cayman that was uh, based, I believe, in Nevada in order to claim to be a U.S. company so that they could gain access to these investor rights under the U.S. Central America Free Trade Agreement. So what that means is that not only do we have to worry about uh, potentially suits being brought by Japanese companies, we can also have to worry about U.S. companies that may have an interest in importing food uh, using, let's say, a, an office in Japan to claim to be a Japanese company to gain greater rights than domestic corporations. 
the uh, what the investor estate system is uh, absurd in that it is designed to the argument for it is that it's supposed to prevent uh, encourage corporate investment by allowing corporations to invest in countries where they may not have trust in the national court system as being fair and they may be worried about uh, the government expropriating their resources. A, co a company doesn't want, uh, let's say, a country to uh, nationalize uh, its private resources. Um, they have they w the idea is that they can have this international forum to bring these cases. Well, that, first of all, doesn't make sense when you're dealing with countries with highly developed court systems like many of the countries in TPP, including Japan. It also doesn't make sense when you look at just how ridiculous these tribunals are. They're tribunals of three unelected uh, trade lawyers who, with no conflict of interest clauses, these may be corporate lawyers in another week. They may have relationships to some of the very corporations in these cases. Uh, there is no appeals process in the, in the national courts of any of the countries for their rulings. It's not that they can necessarily overturn a nation's laws. It's not that the tribunal could strike down a U.S. law. What it could do is demand monetary compensation. And so for many countries, that has, an effect, that has a chilling effect on the passage of legislation that is challengeable under uh, these, uh, this tribunal system. So this could be used as an argument against passing more stringent legislation, saying that it would be in violation of our agreement under, uh, under of our commitment uh, under the agreement um, and would be infringing on the rights of a corporate investor and could potentially bring uh, a suit of this nature. Um, we also need to look in particular at the issues around uh, seafood imports. Uh, the, one of the, there have been major concerns raised in relation to TPP around Malaysian and Vietnamese uh, seafood imports. As it is, the U.S. Uh, only inspects uh, less than 1% of imported seafood. And uh, with Malaysia and Vietnam, there are real concerns about uh, their, their shrimp imports uh, from, Viet, from Vietnam's uh, shrimp farms, which are where there have been high levels of uh, toxic pesticides found in shrimp. There are concerns about, with Malaysia, transshipment of Chinese shrimp. Um, in both cases, uh, with, with, well, in the case of PPP, we'd be looking at increased uh, seafood imports uh, from TCP member nations without a, an increase in over of, of inspection capacity. So we would be, uh, so the same, the, as it is, we're testing an absurd, we're looking at the safety of an absurdly small amount of seafood, but really are not putting anything like the kind of resource investment that would be required by this new import flood. And really, Japan hasn't been a part of that conversation, um, and uh, whereas, well, Malaysia and Vietnam have. Um, the also, another thing that we need to look at in relation to TPP is food labeling. Um, we've already seen at the World Trade Organization several attacks on key food labels. One example is the, uh, the dolphin safe tuna label, which, has been, which is, was for years subject to uh, challenges under first the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and later at the World Trade Organization. This is, as many I'm sure many are familiar, the label that uh, gives consumers an idea of whether the tuna that they're buying uh, used methods uh, that insert methods of tuna catching that encircle dolphins uh, in order to catch schools of tuna that swim with dolphins. So the dolphin safe tuna label was challenged at the WTO. And keep in mind what we're talking about here. We're talking about not a, a ban on imports. We're talking about consumer labeling. Uh, also challenged at the WTO have been uh, have been country of origin labeling on meat meaning that uh, the WTO actually ruled that uh, countries do not have a right to put labels on meat packages that tell people what country those products were made in, um, because that would be discriminatory against, uh, against importers, and because people might favor, uh, might favor homegrown meat, they might favor meat from, uh, they might favor meat from, uh, from countries that they deem safe. So if consumers, uh, based on concerns about this issue, want to avoid uh, buying uh, Japanese products, that could potentially, uh, or, or specific products uh, that they believe are irradiated based on uh, a feeling that Japan is inadequately expecting, inspecting, that could potentially uh, be challenged. And again, one thing that we need to consider different between the WTO and TPP, at the WTO, countries can bring suits against other countries. Under TPP, corporations will be able to bring suits against countries. So if there's a particular corporate uh, interest that feels that their product is losing out uh, because of the, this, these labeling rules, 
that could potentially be challenged under TPP uh, by a corporate investor under TPP. So uh, what can we do about all this? Um, well, you've already been doing a great part of it with this important work around Senator Wyden. We know that uh, TPP, sorry, that Fast Track is expected to be introduced this coming week. We've heard reports that it will be introduced on the 13th or 14th. For uh, people who have, uh, just to give some background for people who are not familiar with why Senator Wyden is so key, he is the ranking member of the Senate Finance Committee. And what that means is that he is the key Democrat on the key committee for Fast Track. Senator Orrin Hatch wants to introduce the Fast Track bill um, and wants it to be presented as a bipartisan bill in both houses. So he has been, so there's been wrangling between uh, Hatch and Wyden over what this Fast Track bill should look like. Wyden wants a few more safeguards in the bill. Fundamentally, he supports Fast Track. He is a big free trader. On the other hand, he tends to be an advocate of, trans of government transparency. So he wants some transparency language, which actually in many ways will make the bill worse. Um, the, the language that's supposed to be about transparency actually will have the opposite effect. Um, and so there's wrangling back and forth between them as to what exactly the bill should look like. The big question has been, uh, on the, uh, has been will Senator Wyden uh, cave ultimately in when he's feeling pressure to not support the bill at all? Because there's been inten an intense campaign against him. Uh, in Oregon, people have been following him around. They have a van. They, people have been doing, um, there have been blimps following him. There's, uh, there are uh, planes with, uh, with, uh, uh, with messages. Um, there are all kinds of different tactics that have been used. There have been protests. That, there have been occupations of his D.C. office, protests at his home in New York, in, uh, New York and D.C. And, sorry, he has a, in, in New York and Oregon. He has a house in New York. There was an, a disruption in a store, that, a bookstore in New York City that his wife owns. So he's been feeling this intense campaign from all directions. There's been threats to primary him uh, by unions if he comes out in support of Fast Track. So that pressure needs to continue until the last minute, until a bill is introduced, and we know that Senator Wyden is supporting it. He needs to keep feeling that pressure. Uh, we all need to be calling him, even if you're not Oregonians, you need to be calling him, but certainly if we know people in Oregon, they need to be calling him. We also need to be calling our own senators, particularly if they are members of the Senate Finance Committee and letting them, and they're Democrats, and letting them know to put pressure on Senator Wyden to not support Fast Track and let him know that it is not a matter of just you know, what the final language of the bill looks like. There is no acceptable Fast Track. There is no version of Fast Track that makes uh, for better legislation uh, than not having Fast Track. Uh, we also can contact our own elected officials uh, and let them know, and try to get commitments out of them to not support Fast Track. If it seems like Fast Track doesn't have the votes to pass, it won't move. What we're trying to do in both houses is a stalling process because as we get later and later in the year, um, it becomes more politically costly. Hillary Clinton is already starting to feel political pressure around the agreement with Europe, uh, even before she's announcing her presidential campaign. So this, is a very, this could be very politically toxic, which is why there's a lot of pressure to move it now. Uh, free trade agreements are wildly unpopular. People know that NAFTA was a job killer for the United States. So while people think international trade is a good thing, they do not think these kind of trade deals are a good thing, and of course they're right. So the, the more we can stall the process, the harder it's going to be politically to move this. The other effect of stalling the process is that it is, helping, it is really helping the TPP negotiations break down. TPP was really moving well at the beginning of the year when President Obama promised that with a new Republican Congress, he would have no trouble getting fast track through as he did with the Democratic Congress, which is a very interesting statement on the part of our president that he is so delighted that his own party lost and that now he can collaborate with the Republicans um, in undermining the values of his own party. But in any case, uh, so now that fast track has stalled because of the pressure of people like us, um, the negotiators are being much more reluctant to make concessions to the U.S. negotiating team. There are still many contentious issues in the ongoing TPP negotiations, and other negotiators from other countries are not necessarily willing to make uh, concessions that could be politically costly at home if they are not convinced that the U.S. will actually be able in the end to deliver on TPP. And the concern is that without fast track, Congress might actually do its job. Congress might deliberate on this agreement. They might study it and understand it and uh, make, and make am amendments to the language and uh, potentially not even pass it at all. 
And so the foreign negotiators do not want Congress to do its job. They want that power to be in the hands of President Obama so that once the negotiation is uh, done, it's a done deal, and then Congress will send the, then Obama will send the uh, agreement to Congress. And uh, as has happened with every trade agreement in history that's been negotiated under fast track, um, that agreement will ultimately pass. So by slowing fast track, we are not only increasing our chances of stopping TPP in Congress, we are actually slowing down the entire tr uh, negotiating process for TPP. And what may potentially happen if we're successful is what happened with the FTA, the Free Trade Area of the Americas, in the early 2000s, which uh, never reached Congress. And the reason it never reached Congress was there was so much external pressure that the entire negotiation broke down. So FTA just kind of fizzled. It quietly went away one day, never to be seen again. And if we do our job right, that is what can happen with TPP. So we need to uh, keep the pressure on up. Uh, so we need to keep up the pressure on our legislators. As I said, Senate Finance Committee members are key. Also key is our members of the House. The real battle in stopping fast track in the end is going to be in the House. Um, if Senator Wyden comes out in support of fast track, uh, we are pretty convinced that fast track will pass the Senate. Um, if he doesn't, um, it's going to be a bigger battle, but still uh, the, the, the numbers game in the Senate is not good for our side in terms of stopping fast track. The House is, is very much a different story. And the reason for that is because uh, in the House, we not only have Democrats on our side, we also have about 50 Republicans on our side. There are Republicans who do not think that uh, ceding massive power to President Obama is a very good idea, that putting President Obama in charge of our international trade negotiations is something that we want to be doing. These are Republicans, many of whom were elected on uh, campaigns around executive overreach and taking power back from President Obama, who is this imperial president who wants more and more power. It does not look very good for, to the further base voters for them to be voting on this legislation that cedes massive power to President Obama. And we should remember that these trade agreements are not really just trade agreements. They have increasingly become a way to tuck domestic legislation um, into, trade deal, into trade agreements. TPP has 29 chapters, only five of which are actually about trade. The rest of the chapters are about all kinds of domestic policy issues that presumably re Republicans in Congress would not want to give President Obama exclusive authority over. Things like regulating Internet use. Um, things like uh, intellectual property rules relating to medicines. So these are reasons why both Democrats and Republicans feel that this uh, feeding of power to the president uh, is a very bad idea. There are also concerns on the right about how these tribunals will affect U.S. sovereignty. There are also concerns about the issue I mentioned before about uh, the the Constitution putting Congress in charge, and there are fears that uh, supporting TPP undermines constitutional separations of powers. So for conservatives who identify as strong constitutional conservatives, that's an issue of principle to uh, respect the spirit of the Constitution, especially when it means giving more power to a president they hate. So in the Senate, in the House, we have, it looks like well over uh, 200 uh, uh, members of the House who are against Fast Track, and it really is going to come down to the last few votes to decide who is against this agreement. And um, with the Central America Free Trade Agreement in 2005, we lost by one vote. That is how these trade agreements also often, trade negotiations often go. The last Fast Track uh, was a very close vote. So we are really now involved in kind of uh, intensive warfare for every last vote uh, we cannot let any we cannot let any member slip away. Every member of Congress, Republican or Democrat, needs to be feeling intense pressure from their constituents to uh, come out against fast track. And and it's not enough for them to say, "Well, I'm considering it." In the you know, I'll, I'll let you know in the future. No, they need to come out against fast track now. Some of them are saying, "I'm waiting for a bill." Well, there may be a bill next week, so they will no longer have that excuse. But even if they don't use that excuse, we can say back to them, Senator Orrin Hatch has said that this fast-track bill will be almost identical to the fast-track bill from last year, the Bipartisan Trade Priorities Act of 2014, which was so unpopular that despite being called a bipartisan bill, it could not find a single sponsor in the House. Even the most pro-free trade members of the House uh, stringent, uh, sorry, strong uh, free trade supporters like Congressman Gregory Meeks of Queens, New York, would not sponsor this bill. 
And so this is basically the same bill rehashed with a new name and new sponsors when, and some minor tweaks. Um, and this is the message we need to send to our elected officials. Uh, Paul Ryan, the new chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, is trying to use this uh, language about how this puts Congress in charge and we need to do this to give Congress a say, really parroting the language of the Obama administration. Um, and so we need to push our, uh, we need to point out to our Republican members, Paul Ryan is sounding an awful lot like Barack Obama. Doesn't that bother you a little bit? Um, we cannot let them get away with that excuse. There is no member of Congress who should be allowed to vote for fast track. On the 18th of this month, there is going to be an international day of action uh, to me, uh, to, against trade agreements like these, against these destructive mega trade agreements that are about more than trade. And we will be uh, encouraging groups all over the country to participate in this day of action and also on actions, uh, day, on actions before and after uh, that action. That's a weekend action, so it's not necessarily the best time to protest members of Congress. Um, but certainly in the days before and after, we need to be getting out there as well as participating in that day of action. Um, people can find out more about this upcoming day of action and some of the other immediate actions coming up. Tomorrow night, there's going to be a national uh, conference call and webinar that is going to feature Senator Bernie Sanders speaking about the threat of TTP and what we need to do to stop it, as well as Arthur Stimulus, who is the Director of Citizens Trade Campaign, which is a national coalition of unions, environmental groups, faith organizations, human rights groups, and other organizations, farm groups, all united in the fight against these destructive trade deals. You can get the details about that event, that webinar, and by going to our website, if you go to tradejustice.net and click on Upcoming Events, you'll see, just click on tomorrow's date, and you'll see the details on how you register for that event. We have webinars every Sunday. There are also national conference calls every Wednesday. So there are lots of opportunities to plug in and find out more. Every Tuesday night, there are national uh, TPP or international TPP Twitter storms where you can take to Twitter and try to get hashtags trending to get the word out about stopping TPP and stopping Fast Track. You can find details on those as well. All of those events in the upcoming events tab of our website, tradejustice.net, and just click Upcoming Events in the left column and you'll see all of that information there. If you're not sure who represents you in Congress and you want to find out, you can go to tradejustice.net forward slash LEG. And uh, if you want a very easy way to make a call to your elected official to let them know that you oppose Fast Track, you can go to stopfasttrack.com and then enter your address and you'll be connected. They'll, you'll get a call that will connect you to your elected official. So there are lots of easy ways to plug in. Uh, for many of us, we may want to engage at levels beyond that, but if we want easy ways to plug people in, those are ways to do it. You can also, at our website, uh, find lots of printable publications that will that you can that you can, you're welcome to print and distribute. None of our materials are copyrighted. You are absolutely welcome to share them with uh, anyone you like and. Uh, if you want to put local contact info on them or anything like that, that's fine. You can contact us directly if you want to make changes to any of the documents. Um, I'm going to give my contact information so people can get in touch with me if you have any questions after the call, though of course I'm happy to stay on and take questions on the line. Um, so my information, you can contact me at 718-218-4523 um, or email me at adam at tradejustice.net. Our organization, Trade Justice New York Metro, is a coalition of groups in the New York metropolitan area. But we work closely with advocates really um, around the country as well as with allies in other countries. So chances are we can connect you with advocates in your community who are already working on this issue. And if there aren't people already working on the issue in your area, we can tell you how to find some of the likely groups that will be working on these issues. Uh, also, uh, you can, our other website, which was mentioned before, gjae.org, that is Global Justice for Animals and the Environment, and okay. is a great place to find out uh, more about some of the environmental aspects of these agreements. Um, Thank you so much, Adam. I think